Hello everyone and welcome back to Space Basics. In this video we are going to take a look at some real life rocket designs that are currently in service and see how they may deviate from the optimal idealized picture of staging that I gave two videos ago. And we are starting with the Proton rocket which is an old design from the 1960s but it is still currently in service. We're sticking to currently in service rockets because there's less experimentation involved. We assume that they had settled on a fairly good optimal design and they were satisfied with it and it wasn't just a result of you know an experiment. Uh, so in this case the Proton rocket has been in service for a very long time and we're starting with it because to some extent it does have idealized staging as far as the Delta V's are concerned. I didn't really explain the Delta V stats window previously but this is the first stage Delta V, this is the second stage Delta V, and this is the third stage Delta V and the entire rocket runs on hypergolic fuels and so we that it's all basically the same kind of engine and we're, we have about the same efficiency except the vacuum engines will get more than the sea level engines so as expected uh, since they get more efficiency they also have more delta v allotted to them whereas the sea level stage does not have as much delta v allotted to it because it's pushing against the atmosphere and it's optimized for that and if we take a look at the sea level thrust, we see that that's 1.4, which we cited as a very good number to go with. And the thrust weight ratio of the second stage and third stage, 1.01 and 0.9, are very good too. And altogether, it takes about nine and a half minutes to get to orbit. I didn't really talk about, uh, uh, it's a little bit complicated because of hot staging, we'll set that aside for now. But uh, I didn't really talk about how long it ought to get that it ought to take to get to orbit, uh, the very minimum would be five minutes and that would entail a very high thrust to weight ratio and be very uncomfortable for passengers. Uh, eight minutes is fairly normal, the space shuttle took about eight minutes and uh, an extreme would be 12 minutes, especially with crew and that's like the Saturn V rocket. Uh, some rockets actually take longer and that's if they're trying to get to higher orbits, not just low Earth orbit. So but 9 minutes and 30 seconds is fairly average and when we see here we this this top number is the payload mass right now and this number right here is the mass of the rocket on the pad so to get the payload fraction we would take that mass and divide it by that mass and what we would see is that it has a payload fraction of less than 3% which is not ideal for the fuels that it is using so why is it not ideal. Why are we not carrying the ideal load if we have ideal staging? Now, I say ideal staging, but we have three stages, which makes things a little bit more complicated, and most rockets will not have three straight stages like this if they're just getting to low Earth orbit. Uh, and the reason for that, and the reason for a lot of things, in fact, maybe the main reason behind everything, is the zeroth reason for why rockets are different from the ideal and that is cost. Uh, we would like rockets not to have three stages because that means that you have developed uh, special staging apparatus for the third stage as well and in this case also there's an additional cost uh, that is borne by having so many engines. There's six engines on the first stage, four on the second stage and let me just scroll up to the third, third stage for a sec. Um, so I'll just, we'll just get rid of all that stuff. Um, let me just take off the second stage here so that we can see it. The third stage only has one engine here. That's the one engine. It's sort of covered by something. But it also has these little vernier thrusters because, of course, as we said before, the one engine cannot steer on its own. It can't control rolls. So it has four vernier thrusters. And this one engine is fixed. It's just the vernier thrusters that do all the control in this case. And there are four of those. So that's a somewhat complicated sort of situation and that has more cost. Uh, a lot of rockets, they'll just have one engine and maybe one vernier on each stage in order to make it simpler or they'll use the gas generator exhaust to control the rocket some other way. Now, it's effectively a vernier. So why is this not optimal except for the cost thing? So we'll have costs at the top but cost was not much of an issue in this case. It's somewhat of an issue but this was also a military rocket, so it had military funding. That always helps. Uh, but 
uh, you know, when people ask, why don't you design the rocket like this? Well, the number one reason is, well, we can't pay for it, <laughs> right? There is no way to run that rocket. Um, but there are other reasons that are also related to cost some ways. And that is one is in the case of the proton rocket in particular is transportation of the stages. So we have these odd little side pods here, these, these guys, the six of them. Why do we have them? They're not boosters. They're not uh, separating. They're not separate from the vehicle. They stick with the vehicle. So you would like to have just a bigger tank there. They, they, they are fuel tanks. Uh, you would just have one bigger tank would be nicer, right? So why do we have them? Why, why do we have these? And the reason is because the transportation system only allowed for this diameter, which is 4.05 meters. And that is truck and rail. And so it is, that is the maximum they could design the stages for. So they added these to supplement the fuel on the first stage as they needed to. And the Soviet Union, which designed the proton rocket, was not the only one that had this thing going. The U for the US, the limit is around 3.71 meters. And that you can see in the shuttle SRBs. They are designed to that diameter. You will also see it in Falcon 9, which is mainly uh, uh, based on the truck diameter rather than the rail, but uh, it's actually 3.66 meters. Anyway, but there have been rockets in the US designed based on the diameter of our transportation systems too. Uh, this is not unusual. So keep that in mind as one thing. But of course, if we could afford to build a completely custom transportation system, uh, then then we could do whatever. And in some cases, of course, with the larger rockets, uh, they do have to, like they use barges and stuff like that uh, to transport it, or the Super Guppy. Uh, the Super Guppy is a special plane to carry lightweight. They're lightweight because the, the tanks are empty at that point. Lightweight but bulky payloads. And the upper stage of the Saturn V rocket was carried by Super Guppy. So anyway, that is one reason. So these pods are one reason why it's inefficient because instead of having a single bigger tank, we have all these and they add more structural mass. The second is how the proton is staged. Uh, you'll note that this, the second stage here, it seems sort of like a grid. It's a grid because the second stage lights while the first stage is actually running still for the last few seconds of the first stage. And the reason for that is to ensure a continuity of thrust because when it was designed, they weren't entirely sure of separation mechanisms that would leave the second stage coasting and then light. And so for safety's sake, to ensure that they would have continuity of thrust, they lit it first uh, and then separated off the first stage when the first stage was done. So they would both be running for about two seconds. Uh, that necessitated the grid because the thrust is going to, oops, that's more in size than I was intending. Uh, the thrust would hit this and then get deflected out like that. Now that means that this has to be pretty darn strong and protected against that. Otherwise it'll rip through and uh, uh, to some extent it's designed to rip through eventually. Uh, there is video of the Titan rocket uh, designed roughly the same time by the United States also had this. And we have onboard camera from the Titan II uh, where the, first, the second stage actually does rip apart the first stage. Uh, so that is somewhat intentional. But uh, the downside to this in terms of its performance as far as getting the payload into orbit is that you are wasting that propellant. That, that thrust is getting deflected out to the side for those few seconds and so that propellant is getting wasted. And uh, that's less of a problem on the third stage, but it's still uh, the case because on the third stage, and if we go up here, uh, it doesn't light the whole engine, it doesn't have the full grid. But what you see here is it does have the verniers sort of sticking out here and deflecting out, and that's because the verniers light first to ensure a continuity of thrust and control. And so while the second stage is running, these four verniers light, and then once it separates the core engine lights. So there is some delta V loss there, but 
a lot of it just has to do with the structural mass of the proton rocket. It was for military applications uh, to some extent, uh, ostensibly, though it was never used for this, uh, to deliver really heavy uh, nuclear weapons. But yeah, uh, as a result, it was overbuilt so that it could be stored for a long time. It wasn't balloon tanks like the Atlas rocket or something like that. Balloon tanks uh, have to be kept pressurized to remain stable. We wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't want that for something for military applications. They want the tanks to be rigid for decades and uh, not susceptible to wear and tear. So anyway, so that is the proton rocket and some of its foibles. And one thing, uh, the key thing is that it emphasizes the interesting feature of what transportation necessity can do to your rocket. Okay, next up we have the Atlas V rocket. This is the bottom of it, and we have three boosters on this rocket, and this is how the rest of it looks. This is a four meter fairing Atlas V rocket. There's also a five meter fairing version uh, that would fit the upper stage inside the fairing instead of having it like this. And this rocket is optimized for high orbits. One thing you'll notice about it is that with this payload, it has far more delta V than is necessary to get to low Earth orbit. Remember, low Earth orbit, ah, well, I still don't understand why it does that sometimes. Uh, low Earth orbit, we have identified as having a requirement of about 9,500 meters per second given drag and the gravity losses. However, not all satellites need to go in low Earth orbit. They would like to go to higher orbits. Geostationary transfer orbit is a common thing and that tacks on plus 2,400 meters per second. And so what that would do is if this is Earth, then a geostationary transfer orbit, the orbit height is 35,786 kilometers. And geostationary transfer orbit is if you start really tight around the Earth and then boost your orbit on this side, you can make the orbit go like that and had a height, a height there but it's not circularized yet so that's it around earth and then so there's geostationary transfer orbit the actual geostationary orbit gso uh well that's geosynchronous orbit but functionally we'll have it uh, geostationary orbit is fine uh, I, or geo geo um that might also require an inclination change. Altogether, the budget is normally about 1,600 meters per second. Oftentimes, the launch rocket is not expected to do this portion. Uh, that portion will be done by the payload itself, but it could be done by the rocket. Some uh, launchers do offer that service. In that case, it'll circularize at that 35,786. So it'll make a circular orbit and the purpose of this circular orbit at that height is so that the orbit period is 24 hours. As a result, since the orbit at that height takes 24 hours to complete, in other words, you start here, you take 24 hours to go around, that means it'll be uh, right over the same spot of the Earth at all times. The closer in orbits, low Earth orbit, so this low Earth orbit, is generally about one hour and 30 minutes. So it's a big gap and it takes a lot of extra delta V to get there. It's worth noting, so that's about 4,000 altogether if the rocket is expected to do all that. Uh, but a lot of times the payload is doing this one. And so uh, lots of rockets will advertise their geostationary transfer orbit capacity of course, they can carry less to geostationary transfer orbit than, can, than they can do to just low Earth orbit. But one thing about this 4,000 meters per second is that for the transfer to the moon, so lunar transfer is normally labeled TLI or translunar injection, that takes 3,200 meters per second generally. And then lunar orbit, uh, I'll just say LO, lunar orbit insertion LOI is also used, is 800 meters per second if it's to a low lunar orbit. So the requirement to get to geostationary or yeah geostationary orbit altogether is about the same as it takes to get to low lunar orbit. So keep that in mind. However, the requirement to get to geostationary transfer orbit is less than that it takes to get to the moon. So what we need 
uh, if we have a geostationary transfer orbit system all together is 11,900 meters per second. So that's a lot more than it takes to get to low Earth orbit, especially the way stages work. Uh, your payload mass goes down tremendously, basically it gets cut to a third. And so instead of expecting 3%, for instance, you'd be expecting a little bit over 1%. And that's, uh, it's only a little bit, it's about the same for the moon. It depends on exactly what fuel your upper stage is using. And generally for these high orbits, the fuel that everybody uses is hydrogen. Uh, it's, yeah, it's the best for this sort of thing. But let us uh, clear all that. So that's an impromptu discussion of higher orbits, but we'll see it in action when I actually demonstrate missions like this. And I'll do that in subsequent videos. But this is just a discussion for the purpose of budgeting our Delta V, our Delta V slash range budget. So taking a look at the Delta V window here, or the Atlas V with three boosters and a 5.65 ton payload. For some reason, I can't click on this window right now. Uh, is it because of the way my, I've been using my pen? Okay, I think the way I've been using my pen has irritated Kerbal. <laughs> so we'll just leave that window down there then. Okay, so this portion of the Delta V is provided both by the first stage and the boosters. This, this number is the core, the core engine. And you'll notice two nozzles. It's actually one engine with two nozzles in order to provide the roll control. Uh, it's one engine because it has shared equipment, but it has two separate combustion chambers and they are controlled separately. So they can turn in opposite directions for the roll control. But as long as any equipment is shared between the two combustion chambers, it will be considered one engine. And that is the case for this engine. Uh, so that core engine, after the boosters separate, provides this much, but it's still running while the boosters are on, and at that point it provides this much. What you'll notice is it provides a whole lot more than the upper stage, even though the upper stage is a more efficient engine. Uh, we would have expected it to be the reverse, and this is the way it's set up, right? This is for geostationary orbit, and still, uh, if it was trying to go to low Earth orbit, the situation would be even worse. So for low Earth orbit, the payload will be heavier and the delta V on the upper stage will be less. And so even it'd be even worse than the current situation. The reason why the delta V is not optimal in this case, even though this is for the geostationary transfer orbit and how the rocket is designed, is a reason number three. So we had cost, re I mean, well, reason number two as far as numbers are concerned, transport. and. The next reason is also related to cost, and that is legacy equipment. Legacy equipment, the use of legacy equipment, uh, also reduces cost, but part of the reason for it is uh, to assert reliability. Basically, they're saying that, well, this equipment is already tested, we've launched it before, so you can rely on it, and that encourages customers to uh, go ahead and use the rocket, right? Put their payloads on the rocket. And in this case, the main legacy equipment is this stage, the Centaur stage. Instead of making this stage bigger, sorry, I, I started using the, the mouse instead of by handwriting, but uh, the Centaur stage with its RL-10, which is also a legacy engine, uh, allowed the assertion of reliability even as the first stage changed. So the Centaur stage is a little bit small and also there's a cost issue with the centaur stage originally the centaur stage had two still don't know why it does that originally the centaur stage had two rl10s but they were lower thrust the in order to cut down on costs the they decided to make the single rl10 higher thrust just a little bit and then cut it down from two to one to make it cheaper and so it has a longer burn time, but that means that they couldn't functionally increase the size of the Centaur stage uh, to accommodate higher thrust that would be coming from the booster version of the Atlas V. However, if the Atlas V doesn't have these boosters, then its thrust weight ratio is very low, 1.15 there. So it can't really carry, without the boosters, it can't really carry a heavier Centaur stage anyway. 
But you can see the delta V from the first stage is much higher, well, it's substantially higher than the centaur stage's delta V. And that is partly because it needs to provide all that in order to avoid having more engines on the centaur stage because the centaur stage has a very low thrust to weight ratio, 0.36. It practically needs to be really close to orbit uh, in order to get to orbit because otherwise it'll just fall back down. It's just not accelerating very quickly if it's fully fueled. So uh, the first stage has to do most of the work to get to orbit if we're going to keep the centaur stage at one engine. If you put more engines on that stage, then yes, you could uh, make a smaller or you could change the first stage configuration in a number of ways. But this all comes back down to cost. So cost, transport, and legacy equipment. Uh, legacy equipment being a big thing on the Alice, but also the cost of how many engines you want to put on the second stage. So functionally, this is a one engine up there, except they will use two engines. They could always have used two engines on the Centaur because it was originally designed for it. Uh, they will have a two engine Centaur for crewed missions for the CST-100 uh, crew capsule from Boeing. Uh, so there's, but normally there's just one engine up there and this is effectively one engine with two uh, chambers. So, and that uh, for a lot of Russian engines, and this was a Soviet engine, uh, that sort of happens. They have shared equipment on multiple combustion chambers. And it increases that Atlas rocket's main feature, and uh, the main feature of a number of rockets, uh, is that they can increase their capacity with the use of solid rocket motors. So this adds modularity to it, so SRB. <laughs> uh, solid rocket motors, they're not efficient on their own. However, when combined with the first stage, will add thrust to weight ratio. The first stage only has that horrible 1.15 thrust to weight ratio by default. But once you add the SRB, just one of them, whoop, you can see that the one SRB gives it uh, 1.35 off the pad. And then if you add more, it'll get even more. So then you can put more payload on and it'll still be good to go. So that is a feature of many rockets, but some of them require the SRBs to get off the ground. And let's take a look at one of those. Okay, so this is a model of the Ariane 5 rocket uh, from the European Space Agency. And this is also a rocket that is designed for high orbits, for geostationary transfer orbit. And we see again the delta V that we would expect for that, except right now it's carrying the James Webb Space Telescope, which also had to go to a very high orbit, so same difference basically. But you'll notice the same sort of features that we saw on the Atlas V rocket, in that the boosters, these guys, and the core, that one, uh, provide almost all of the delta V in order to get to orbit, and the upper stage, which has a horrible thrust to weight ratio, but also has just one engine. Uh, they could have put more engines if they wanted to have higher thrust to weight ratio, but cost. Uh, and they didn't need to as long as the core is doing all the work. It uh, just finishes orbit and then boosts the payload out to the high orbits, either geostationary transfer orbit or maybe to the moon or, or in this case to a Lagrange point. So, and Lagrange points we'll talk about way later. Uh, but the boosters are necessary because even after the boosters run out, the core doesn't have much thrust to weight ratio. Um, yeah, that's, that's a special thing right there. Uh, but the rocket starts out with a lot of thrust to weight ratio to get through the atmosphere and through the gravity losses as quickly as possible. So that makes up for it, but still the core has to maintain a fairly high pitch in order to make sure that it doesn't fall back down and it has enough time so that the upper stage can complete orbit. Now, in the Ariane 6, the redesign, the new version that's coming out, they have increased the thrust of the upper stage engine by quite a lot, uh, so that it's not so severe. 0.23 is really pushing it. And so it'll be able to carry uh, payloads a little bit better without, carry, uh, without holding the pitch so much. And they will also have four boosters uh, to add modularity. Right now, it can't, uh, accommodate different payloads as much. It's always configured like this with the core and two boosters. 
they would like to be able to uh, cut down on costs when there is less payload and then when there's a heavier payload then only put more boosters so instead of having two big boosters they'll have four small boosters and sometimes if the payload is light they'll just put two so that is what the area in six is configured as so here again the main driver is cost because otherwise they would surely uh, put uh, more engines on the upper stage they might put two engines on the core stage uh, to give it a better thrust to weight ratio but these engines are very expensive both the engines so on the Atlas V rocket the core engine on the first stage was a kerosene oxygen engine that's relatively cheap and the upper stage engine is hydrogen and oxygen which is relatively complicated here both engines are hydrogen and oxygen which requires wider tanks so this is a five meter tank and so it can't be transported by rail or anything like that uh, unless it's a custom rail uh, but yeah those tanks that's much wider and also the upper stage tank is also a hydrogen oxygen tank so it's just they just made it the same diameter for simplicity sake oh my the, the, in this save the James Wood Space Telescope doesn't have its proper textures but anyway this is a wider rocket to accommodate the less dense fuel and so that's an additional complexity but overall, if we really uh, cut down to what it can do to low Earth orbit, it can take about 22 tons. But yeah, it's not optimized for that. But part of the drop in efficiency here is how reliant it is on the SRBs. The SRBs do not have the efficiency of the hydrogen and oxygen. And so uh, the hydrogen and oxygen here, we're carrying about 170 tons of it. And the SRBs themselves are uh, 278 tons in mass, 240 tons in repellent. So of the total rocket mass, uh, about uh, three quarters of it is the mass of the solid propellant and the boosters. Remember, the hydrogen is taking up a lot of space, but it's not very dense. So this is all very light here. These boosters are very heavy. And so the fact that the boosters are so much mass and yet have so little efficiency. Their efficiency is 277 in vacuum right now, whereas the core engine's efficiency in vacuum is 429, so much better. Uh, but most of the mass is the boosters. So that is why we are not getting a high payload fraction to high orbit. I mean, it is high orbit that we're aiming for. But yeah, that is the sort of logic behind the Ariane 5. Let's take a look at the other significant rocket that's active these days. Uh, well, Soyuz is a whole other design. Uh, the Soyuz is still active, but that is a whole other topic. But a lot of rockets follow Ariane 5's model. Uh, the other rocket in particular I'm thinking of is the H-2 rocket by Japan. Japan's H-2 rocket is the same setup. Uh, the setup is hydrogen and oxygen in the core hydrogen and oxygen in the upper stage so best efficiency possible and then slapping on SRBs and the whole rocket being optimized for geostationary transfer orbit rather than low earth orbit but also another rocket that's similar is the US uh, Delta IV okay so with Falcon 9 you'll know I don't have the landing legs and grid fins on right now but the first design feature of Falcon 9 to cut down on costs, everything has to cut down on costs, but it was using the same engine for the first stage and second stage, just nine of them on the first stage and one of them on the second stage. This was to facilitate cost reduction by mass production rather than cost reduction by just making fewer things. So they'll make 10 engines per rocket, but it's all the same type instead of making two different types of engine. And uh, on Proton, it's still just two different types of engine. There's uh, six of one type, the first type of engine, the RD-253 on the first stage, then four of the RD-0210s uh, on the second stage, and just one of the 0120s on the second, uh, third stage, sorry. So just one engine all the way through, no boosters. So keeping it simple as far as the engine types are concerned, the Falcon 9 is optimized for low Earth orbit, not for high orbits. And as a result, we see here a uh, 9,646 meter per second with 21 tons. It can do more than 21 tons. Uh, this is without reusability. So, yeah, uh, that is 
fairly well set up. And if you take a look at the fraction, taking 21 tons and divide it by uh, 570, let me just do the math. Uh, we get 3.7, which is very good for the propellant that this is using. I've got the Falcon Heavy uh, interstage there, but um, this is using kerosene and oxygen, which in the previous video I had identified as having an, a sort of number that we're going for as 3.5. So getting 3.7 is very good. And But you'll notice the thrust to weight ratio here. That's probably because we have the non-upgraded engines, though. Uh, they upgraded the Merlin engines over time so that there is a higher thrust version and they got the higher thrust by increasing the chamber pressure and so I would have to go through uh, all of these engines and increase the thrust on them but ultimately uh, the higher thrust allowed them to have a larger tank and get higher payload to orbit so if I eventually go through and get these to the right numbers we will get a decent thrust weight ratio of about 1.3 ish. So 1.36 with all the engines upgraded there. And uh, the upper stage engine also needs to be upgraded. Okay, now I think wrong inner stage, but now we've got the right second stage. One thing you'll notice is that the upper stage has a 0.73 thrust to weight ratio here. And that when the first stage separates, that's pushing a little bit, but it's still okay. Remember the second stage does not need a thrust to weight ratio of one. As long as the first stage has the 1.36, it can get off the ground. The second stage is more efficient than the first stage, but not so much more efficient considering both stages are using the same propellant, unlike the Atlas rocket where the upper stage has a different propellant than the first stage. Uh, we wouldn't normally expect so much more delta V from the second stage of the first stage than the first stage if it was optimized. The reason for this, the reason why the second stage does so much more work is because the first stage is designed to come back. In order to make sure that your first stage returns, uh, it is best not to give it more than about 4,000 meters per second. Uh, uh, and some of that will be used for the landing burn. So that is why it's configured like this, emphasizing the upper stage, making sure the upper stage does more so that the first stage can return. To a large extent, the Starship Super Heavy is even more extreme in this. The first stage does even less by comparison, and the Starship itself does more. In that case, though, the Starship is also meant to return, though it'll do its shuttle style instead of trying to do a boost back and landing or some. Well, it'll do a landing, but it'll use a lot of drag to help itself out. So, yes, that is why the split is like this, but otherwise, Falcon 9 is a very optimized rocket for its purpose. Very lightweight construction. So just go, going over some of the reasons, cost, uh, transportation, legacy hardware, which improves, uh, improves the perception of reliability, uh, mass production, recoverability, and uh, I introduced it earlier, but we'll put it down here, uh, and that's high orbit optimization. So that's for GTO, Geo, Lunar, etc. So yeah, those are some of the reasons, perhaps not all the reasons, why the rockets will have stages that do not look like what I was talking about in the first video. Oh, and we could add into that the SRBs. So. SRB modularity, meaning that the SRBs can allow you to modify your payload capacity and also that ties into cost. Okay, so with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.